Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 6D, where we're going to talk about examples of analysis of single genes and small groups of genes as part of personal genomics. We'll talk about um, alleles associated with disease risks. We'll talk about a new technique called pre-implantation screening that's a tremendous improvement in outcomes both for people, parents who are dealing with serious genetic diseases, and older women who are struggling to get pregnant. We'll talk about using typing for tumor prognosis. What is this tumor going to do and how will we treat it? And for identifying cancer risk. And finally, we'll talk in particular about the cancer-causing alleles of the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. So our first example is an Ashkenazi Jewish screening panel offered by Sick Kids, which is the Children's Hospital in Toronto. And Ashkenazi Jews have a high risk of certain genetic diseases because of a long ago history of inbreeding. Um, it's probably the case that many other populations, as they were studied in as much detail as the Ashkenazi Jews, and other populations with inbreeding will also show risks of different genetic diseases. But in any case, there is a screening panel specifically for Ashkenazi Jews. That's most of the European Jewish populations. Um, and it screens for seven diseases that are common in Ashkenazi Jews. Um, Bloom syndrome, Kavanagh disease, um, I won't read them all. Now, for um, families of Jewish origin, this is a very valuable test because it allows the parents to be tested before they have children so that they know what the risks are. It also, of course, allows children to be tested, um, perhaps in time to institute therapies for genetic diseases that they may have. I next want to introduce a technique called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. This is of enormous value to parents or people who wish to become parents, but carry a mutation causing a serious genetic disease. We can consider two cases, um, both of which will become clearer after Module 7 and Module 8 when we discuss the mechanisms of inheritance. So if both parents are heterozygous for the same harmful recessive allele, for example, the CFTR allele, um, even though they're both healthy, they have a 25% risk of, an, of a homozygous child. Um, if one parent has an allele that's harmful when heterozygous, for, for instance, a parent who has a retinoblastoma allele, or a woman who's a carrier for a harmful X-linked allele, such as DMD, which causes Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a very serious X-linked disease, they have, every child has a 50% risk of having the harmful allele. And until very recently, the only thing that genetics could offer to these families was prenatal screening um, several months after conception, and then a recommendation for abortion or the possibility of abortion if the fetus was discovered to be likely to suffer from the disease. The advent of an improvement in in vitro fertilization has given these families a much better option. And I'll first just outline how the procedure works. So we can consider, for instance, parents where the mother is heterozygous for a defective retinoblastoma allele. She probably suffered from retinoblastoma as a baby, but these tumors are highly curable. Now they want to have children. So they undergo in vitro fertilization instead of getting pregnant the normal way. So eggs and sperm are mixed in a Petri dish, and their fertilized eggs are allowed to develop into embryos. These are very small embryos. I think usually it's at the eight cell stage. Then a single cell is removed from each embryo, and that single cell is used for DNA typing. You remember I said that um, PCR technology could amplify the DNA from a single cell to a concentration that lets its sequence be determined. So the amplified 
DNA of each cell is then tested to see which alleles the cell carries. In this case, two of the embryos were heterozygous for the retinoblastoma allele, but the third embryo was homozygous for the normal allele. So this is the embryo that will be implanted in the woman. Now, I described the use of pre-implantation genetic analysis in a diagnostic way to eliminate embryos that have known defective alleles, but it plays another role as well, and that's a screening role. Um, and it's used um, mainly for older women who are trying to get pregnant, because the same technique can be used to identify and eliminate embryos that have defective chromosomes. So defective chromosomes are a very common problem in older women. Well, you'll learn more about this in um, module seven and eight, especially module seven where we talk about meiosis and module 10 where we talk about chromosome abnormalities. Um, so one of the providers of this pre-implantation screening published provides this graph where they compare the typical success rate for um, in vitro fertilization without screening, just eggs and sperm come together, form an embryo, and the embryo is implanted, where you see a very sharp decline in success rate with the mother's age. goes down from about 35% if she's under 35 to only about 6% if she's over 41. However, if each embryo is screened with pre-implantation screening, then the success rate remains is higher even for the younger mothers, and it remains high, largely independent of how old the mother is. One downside of this is that it adds extra cost to what's already a very expensive procedure. So here is one company's estimate of the costs. These are the costs typically associated with in vitro fertilization. There's also the cost of the medications that are needed, which the patient has to pay herself. Um, and then there's an additional cost of $3,500 for the pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Now, for a woman who's older than 35, the benefit of the improved chance of success with this diagnosis more than outweighs the extra cost of the test. A third way that um, gene panels can be used is looking for specific genetic changes in a tumor. Um, here's a company that offers a range of services. They call themselves molecular intelligence. But what they do is they take tumor samples and they test them for alleles of an array of genes that are often mutated in tumors in the hope of generating information that allows therapy to be improved. Now, the concern with this, you'll realize from our discussions of cancer so far, is that cancers are very variable, especially remember the analysis of the kidney tumors in lecture 4J, where the metastases were found to be quite different than the tumor, and even different parts of the tumor had different genotypes. So knowing the genotype of a tumor is kind of a, a dream state. It's not a reflecting reality of tumor genotypes. Now, here's another company that offers all kinds of cancer, cancer testing. They're screening for cancer risk alleles, but they're also screening for other aspects of cancer. Um, they list here a cancer panel, prostate cancer, breast and ovarian cancer, colon and endometrial cancer, polyposis syndrome, which is a precursor of kinds of colon cancer, melanoma, a very serious skin cancer, and lung cancer. And for each, they say, learn more. So I clicked on their links, and here's what I found out. Their cancer panel screens for risk factors for eight cancer types. So this is something you would take before you got cancer, um, hoping to tell you what things you should be carefully screened for. 
For prostate cancer, this does two things. They screen for risk factors, but it's intended for people who already have prostate cancer. They also screen for tumor type, and they use the information of risk factors and tumor type as a way to optimize treatment of the cancer. BRCA1 and BRCA2, I'll say more about in a minute. For colon and endometrial cancer, you remember when we talked about colon cancer, there were some forms of colon cancer that had a very high association with particular genotypes. These genotypes were fairly rare. It was only like 1 or 2% of all colon cancers. This test screens for one of those high-risk genes for colon cancer. This test screens three other risk factors for um, polyposis syndrome, which can lead to colon cancer. The melanoma test is quite intriguing. Melanomas are a form of skin cancer. Initially, a melanoma on your skin looks very much like a benign brown mole on your skin. It's, you know, it's a little more ragged around the edges and it's getting bigger, but it's not easy to tell an early melanoma from a harmless mole on your skin. So this test takes the a small sample of tissue from what could be a melanoma but could be a mole and tests it for genetic markers that are typical of the changes in melanomas. The intent is to improve diagnosis, not treatment, so that moles that are actually melanoma can be treated early. Finally, their lung cancer is a panel for characterizing lung cancer tumors. They look at 46 genes, all of which are genes that affect aspects of the cell cycle, and they use these as indicators to modify the treatment appropriately for the genotypes. And this, of course, has the same concerns that I raised on the previous slide. Now, myriad genetics got their start because they were the first group to sequence the human BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes and to develop a genetic test for these. That test was very profitable because they were given a patent on the sequences. And this patent was controversial from the start because there was a great deal of disagreement about whether you should even be allowed to patent genes at all. But they developed the test and they charged 3,000 or more dollars for each test. That's a lot. Um, Compare that to the $900 charge that I circled um, in a previous lecture for an osteogenesis imperfecta test using the same technology. The difference is they have a patent, so they don't have any competition. Now, this, there was a lot of outrage, both from scientists and from the breast cancer community. And in 2013, 16 years later, finally, the Supreme Court declared that the patent was invalid. Great celebration among scientists, among breast cancer, people at risk of breast cancer. But Myriad Genetics still charges $3,000 to $4,000 for their test. How can they do this? Well, they claim that their test is still better than everybody else's test because they have a large database of all of the BRCA1 and BRCA2 alleles that they discovered in their 16 years of sequencing patients. And so their, their database includes rare alleles, whereas the public databases don't include as many alleles. And so they say that this makes their test better than the other tests. Now, many of the alleles in their database are also in open public databases. Here's just examples of two databases. Um, I know that this one is open. You can go in and look around. You can look at all kinds of data on the distribution of mutations, but they don't have all the mutations. But researchers are working to get more. Um, some of the mutations, the most common ones, are included in the standard SNP chips that I'm going to talk about next. Unfortunately, um, if you're interested in using getting this information for this $99, these are very good value chips, the problem is that 
because of concerns about whether people should be allowed access to their own genetic information, um, the 23 is, and me are currently not allowed to provide this information to new subscribers. So we've considered four examples of personal genomics with small panels fo focusing on one or a few segments of the one or a few genes. We considered the Ashkenazi Jewish panel of mutations that are common in a particular inbred population. Um, we considered pre-implantation diagnosis and screening. We talked about cancer screening, both screening for risk factors and for the properties of tumors. And we talked about BRCA screening and the high cost of patents and of secret databases. Now, coming up next, I'm going to introduce a resource called HapMap. You've actually already seen output from HapMap. And this is preparation for thinking about how analysis of SNPs allows us to predict both phenotypes and infer ancestry over whole genomes for hundreds and thousands of people. I hope to see you there.